last year at this time, just about a year ago, um, I talked about the film Selma, which many of us saw, which was, I thought, a great celebration of the march and of the work of Dr. King. Fortunately or unfortunately, we've had 12 months since then, and many sad challenges to civil rights and social justice, um, including excessive police force, whether we talk Ferguson, whether we talk New York City, whether we talk Baltimore, unfortunately, the list is too long. There's clearly much more to be done. As was raised, you know, we have many people who've been imprisoned, many for the wrong reason. They come out of jail, they can't get jobs. We have to address the issue of ex-felons to bring them into our society, to be contributing members of society, and we have to pass legislation to address that. We also have to deal with restorative justice in all institutions. It's not just penalizing people, it's restoring the quality of life and being uh, a contributing person to society. And we also have to create more jobs and opportunities. A couple of weeks ago, I heard an interview um, with the progressive Atlanta rapper Killer Mike. Now, I didn't know Killer Mike. <laughs> but he talked about Dr. King, and that Dr. King didn't just talk about social justice, as, as Reverend Coates uh, talked about, but economic justice and international justice, particularly in the later years. It wasn't long after Dr. King was assassinated in the late 60s and 70s that our economy took a turn, a wrong turn. 35 years ago or so, we had a president, Ronald Reagan, who introduced us to something called the trickle-down theory. The theory was very simple. If you cut taxes on the wealthiest among us, the millionaires and billionaires, and you cut taxes on the corporations, they would take that money and reinvest it in their businesses and their workforce, and all the people of the country would benefit. And their, their, their income would rise like this. He was wrong. <laughs> and in case people didn't believe that he was wrong, a report came out last week from the Pew Research Institute. Pew Charitable Trust, you might have heard of them, very reputable. And this is what they said. 34 years ago, the middle class households, their percent of personal income stood at 62%. So 62% of all personal income stood in middle class households. 34 years later, that dropped to 43%. It dropped by one third. Middle class households, their percentage of income. At the same token, at the same time, the upper class, 34 years ago, controlled 29% their households of personal income, 29%. And today, it is 49%. Their, their percentage of personal income rose 66%. So in 34 years, the middle class lost a third of their income and value, while the upper class increased theirs by two thirds. And we see it in our own neighborhoods. East Pines, New Carrollton, and nearby, we see the foreclosures, the effect it has on our communities. You all can tell those stories as well or better than I can. We also know that the middle class is vanishing. Yeah. And that the hope of a better life for our children, which we all work for, is proving to be much more difficult than, than we thought it would be. We've also seen the reduction of labor unions. The people who brought us the eight-hour day and protecting workers' rights, the group, ironically, that Dr. King was marching with in Memphis when he was assassinated. Working middle-income people are frustrated that the people, the 1% of 1% are benefiting so much and everyone else is losing. And I have to say, I believe that's why the candidacy of Senator Bernie Sanders resonates with many people because he's telling it like it is regarding the transfer of wealth and incomes. But there are some other people who have some different solutions. 
they offer another approach to the problem. And what is their solution? They say, why don't we distract people from their problems, particularly their financial problems? Let's turn their heads in another direction. And what do they do? Let's focus on another problem. So you don't think of your pocketbook. And what is that problem? Well, how about we talk about Latin American immigrants and how bad they are? Why don't we talk about Muslims, all Muslims, and how much of a danger they are to every one of us? Or how about the audacity of the Black Lives Matter movement? It's exactly the strategy and tact that Donald Trump is taking. It's to talk about this fear, this bigotry. And he has gained support. Make no bones about it. He has gained support from people who look like him, skin, not hair, <laughs> and, and people who share his bigotry, and people who fear losing their privilege. That's who he's attracting, and he's doing it through distracting them from the real problems. Find some scapegoats, get people's mind off their problems, and play to their baser instincts. Now, what does it remind us of? <laughs> that was my number two, but I'm getting to that. <laughs> and Jaden read my speech. <laughs> yeah, look, absolutely. In the rise of fascism, what did Hitler do? You know, a fanatic, fear-mongering, get people's off, minds off their economic problems. And closer to home, I'd have to say George Wallace, the segregationist, did the exact same thing. You know, I don't think I need to ask the question of what would Martin do in the, if he heard this kind of rhetoric. I, Reverend Coates asked the same question, but I think we all know. He would stand up for racial justice and he'd confront, he would confront the fear monger. He was a religious leader, Dr. King, a student of philosophy, he had a PhD, an advocate for social justice, and it brought to mind another religious leader, a theologian, who about 70 years ago, uh, Martin Niemöller. And Martin Niemöller was a theologian, uh, a pastor, during the rise of fascism in, in Europe. And he famously said, and I'm sure many of you have heard this, first they came for the socialist and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionist, the union members, and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. And I think what Reverend Niemöller said in 1935 or 1940 is, a, is a clearly what we're witnessing today with the fear-mongering and the bigotry. And in that same speech that uh, Reverend Coates talked about, or, or at least his 63 speech at the Lincoln Memorial, he talked about the urgency of the moment. And we can't forget that, because while he was speaking in the heat of the Civil Rights Movement in 1963, <coughs> it's a message that clearly is appropriate today. Now, flipping to some good news. About a month ago, President Obama, a beneficiary of Dr. King and the Civil Rights Movement, was with 189 other countries in Paris and had the United States sign an international climate change agreement. 189 countries. Absolutely, a great thing. But while 189 countries could agree, in this country today, we still have climate change deniers who have their head in the sand in our own country. And some of these very same people are the people who badmouth the president every step of the way. The very same people and probably would like to push the clock back to 1950 or with some of them, they would probably want to go to 1850 before the fight against slavery. And if we take it another step further and with all due respect to my, my friend the congressman, some of these same people, these whack jobs, sit in our Congress. I agree. <laughs> they ignore science. They ignore data. They ignore 
the droughts and the storms and the flooding, and they just say, it's not happening. In the Pacific Ocean, there's something called the Marshall Islands. And in the Indian Ocean, there's something called the Maldive Islands. Those people understand they will be extinct in a couple of generations. Nothing's going to save them. Yet we have people in Congress who deny it's happening. Well, here in Maryland, we don't deny it's happening. And six years ago, I introduced and the legislature passed with all of the support of my colleagues, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act that mandated the state of Maryland reduce its greenhouse gases by 25% by 2020. And we're on the path to do just that. But we're not stopping because the more we read about science, it's a lot worse than we think. The Antarctic ice cap, you know, Greenland ice cap, it's a major problem. So in the coming weeks, I'll be introducing legislation to have a 40% reduction of greenhouse gases by 2030. And with your help, we're going to pass that legislation. And I'll be working with my committee on another issue that, that's close to our district, and that's education. 40 to 50% of every new teacher who starts by the end of their fifth year have left the profession. Across the state and in Prince George's County, 40 to 50% of all brand new teachers leave by the end of their fifth year. Now, that clearly does harm to a school system because they have to rehire, but worse, it does harm to our children. Because many who come from impacted homes and major challenges have enough instability in their lives. And to have to go through teacher after teacher after teacher is an abomination. And we have to do a better job to attract and retain our, our teachers, our quality teachers, to improve our schools. And I will be introducing some legislation to make some of those improvements in the coming weeks. And let me reiterate something Delegate Washington said. They cut 20 million, the governor cut $20 million from schools in our county and $68 million across the state. And they were cut from not equally across the state. That $68 million, where did it come from? Baltimore City, Prince George's County, Baltimore County, and Montgomery County. The largest African American populations and Latino populations in the state. And just a month ago, he said he found $5 million and he sent it to Allegheny and Garrett and Kent counties who happened to vote for him. That's a problem. So education is first and foremost on our mind and we will not let that happen again. The governor has one more theme and then I'll, I'll try to bring this to a close. He wants to reduce taxes. Now, none of us want to pay taxes. But if you don't have taxes, you don't have government. And who gets harmed if you don't have schools, don't have public safety, or don't have transportation, or don't have healthy air, healthy water, or healthy land? It's working people, it's middle income people, but he wants to cut taxes. We want to protect our environment. We want to keep our schools moving and improving. We want to have roads and mass transit so we can get around. And we're going to continue to fight for those efforts in the work we do here. So let me, let, let me close. You know, this irresponsible fear mongering that I mentioned earlier, and I would call near fanaticism on the national stage, runs counter to everything Dr. King advocated and spoke for, and which he gave his life for. Remaining silent, and I think Reverend Coates uh, touched on this, and, and Congressman Van Hollen, remaining silent in the face of this onslaught is just unacceptable. We cannot be silent. If you're silent, they run over you. And you'll realize, well, I don't want to be the only one to speak out, but someone has to start that in your neighborhood, in your community, in your church, in your synagogue, down here in Annapolis, because you find one person speaks out, there are two others who wanted to speak out, but were waiting for someone else. And once those three do it, there are five others. And before long, you have hundreds and thousands of people 
And Chris Van Hollen is absolutely right. We can have enlightened legislators, but we need people back home who stand behind us because it's a heck of a thing to think you're leading and turn around and no one's behind you. <laughs> it ain't fun, trust me, I've been there. <laughs> we need your help. We need it in 22nd District and we need it in 46 other districts to pass progressive things. So you can be sure that I and my delegation, great people, will not be silent. We will continue to promote a progressive agenda both here in Annapolis and back home in the 22nd District. And with your help, with your help, we can promote the kind of justice that Dr. King advocated so successfully for and gave his life for. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.